seeking language from other people. Starting this meeting, what I'd like to do is to make a presentation. Uh, every year there is a congressional award uh, that is given to a young person in every congressional district in the country. And today we have Jack Beckett from Brookfield, or from Wauwatosa, who attends Brookfield Academy as the award winner uh, for the 5th Congressional District of Wisconsin. Now, Jack, you want to step right up? Okay. Um, you know, let me say that uh, the selection of winners of this award is not done by a member of Congress, any members of Congress. There is a completely nonpartisan uh, committee that has been set up to review the applications and decide uh, who wins the award. And let me talk a little bit about what Jack did to get this award. Uh, he volunteered at a growing farm and traveled to Peru to volunteer at an orphanage. He taught kids English and repaired buildings. Uh, for his personal development part, he read science and health and regularly discussed the content with his advisor. In addition, he did research on Mary Baker Eddy, who is the author of Science and Health, and to develop his understanding of Christian science and its origins. Uh, he was a physical fitness part of it. He improved his soccer skills and started lifting weight. And he also had to go on an uh, expedition, so he planned and executed a 10-mile kayaking trip down the Wisconsin River. Now, this is an awful lot of out-of-school, extracurricular activity, and it is something that I think is very, very deserving of the award that I am going to present to you comes in a box, and then it comes in a case, like that. Wow. Okay, now let me call the formal part of this meeting to order. Thank you all for coming. Also, thank the library for letting us use the Constitution Room today. For those of you whom I haven't met, I'm Jim Sensenbrenner, your congressman. Seated up here with me is State Representative Joe Sanfilippo, who represents part of West Dallas and part of New Berlin, and is here to answer your comments, answer your questions, and listen to your comments about state issues like I try to do on the federal issues. I want to thank the library for setting the meeting up and also to local law enforcement officials for their public service this afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to hear your concerns. In fact, in 2017, I held 115 public meetings, and I have logged close to 50 so far this year. You may have heard that some of these meetings have become very contentious, so I want to be sure to review the rules we need to adhere to so that we can have an orderly environment in which to exchange ideas. First, I ask all of you to sign in with my staff. If you would like an opportunity to speak, you need to check the speaking box that appears on the sign-in slips. That way I'll know to call on you during the first part of the meeting. I will have given priority to those of you who reside in West Dallas or surrounding communities, and then if time permits, I will continue to call on residents of the 5th Congressional District who don't live in West Dallas. If additional time is available, I will call on those who don't reside in the 5th District. The first portion of the meeting will last about an hour and 20 minutes, uh, which puts us up to about 2.55 on West Dallas official time in the back of the room. <laughs> I expect participants to be respectful and allow the person who is recognized and has the floor the opportunity to speak without interruptions, as well as when I respond to each comment. Further, if the question you would like to ask or the comment you would like to make has already been made, please refrain from asking it again. That way I can talk to more people, I can deal with more issues, and we're able to cover more ground. If at any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting as there's nothing positive to be gained 
from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. We all can disagree without becoming disagreeable. Signs are okay in the room as long as they are not disruptive or obstructive. The second portion of the meeting, which will start about 2.55, is devoted to those of you who seek my help with personal problems they're experiencing with the federal government. If you have a state agency problem, Representative San Filippo will take down the information. This part of the meeting is an opportunity for us to have a one-on-one -on -one private conversation and it is not the time to continue discussions from the general part of the meeting. Any filming or recording is prohibited during this part of the meeting and let me say the reason for that is a lot of people uh, want to talk to me about problems they have with their medical care at the VA and there's no reason why this should be recorded or taped and the world knowing about it when it gets put up on the internet, usually ASAP. So I, I have to strictly enforce uh, uh, the no taping or recording. So without any further ado, the first up will be Robert Reedy of South 110th Street. Mr. Reedy. Yes, about the uh, affordable care, or about the uh, laws that you passed for taxes. Mm -hmm. You didn't do anything about the taxable part of Social Security becoming taxable. You didn't raise the where the base is or anything where people with uh, Social Security and they're getting their minimum withdrawals from their 401s or IRAs and they're now be finding the Social Security becoming taxable. So are you going to correct that or is that something that we have to put up with? So I have a truthful answer is something we're going to have to put up with but I think that that was a very bad move that Congress made during 1993 uh, when the taxable part of Social Security uh, was increased. It was also increased in 1983. So Reagan is to blame for the first part and Clinton is to blame for the second part. The reason I am very strongly opposed is that if you look at every other type of retirement plan, whether it's a pension fund, whether it's an IRA, whether it's a 401k, or anything else, you only pay tax once. Meaning you pay tax when you, before you put the money into the plan, or if you don't do that, you pay tax when the money comes out of the plan after your retirement. Social Security is double taxed, uh, and that's wrong. And it should not be put at a disadvantage uh, uh, to every other type of retirement plan that people either set up for themselves or are set up for them by their employer or by somebody else. I was the only senator representative from Wisconsin in 1983 that voted against the first tax, uh, <clears throat> which was part of a Social Security bailout plan. I also voted against the second tax in 1993. <clears throat> I would vote in an instant to repeal both of those taxes uh, however, I've never had a chance because none of the repealer bills have come out of the Ways and Means Committee. And the truthful part of the answer is, is that uh, we now have had almost 25 years since the second tax was passed, and there has never been any movement in the Ways and Means Committee to repeal that tax or the first one. So the thing is, I didn't vote to put it on. I would vote to take it off but the chances are slim to none that I'm going to have a chance to vote on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Carla Krieger, South 75th Street in West Dallas. I just want to know for better as well as state about wasteful spending. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of it. Okay, we can pay for stuff we really don't need anymore. Okay. We shouldn't have had it to begin with. And, it, and it's costly. I mean, every time you turn around, you're paying more and more, people are paying more and more money out of the paychecks. For what? Well, uh, people who benefit from the wasteful spending will tell you that the spending is absolutely essential. I disagree with that. You know, I am proud of the fact that I have always been the top in the entire Wisconsin congressional delegation that has voted <coughs> against increased taxation and appropriation bills. And appropriation bills, you know, have a huge amount of wasteful spending in it. And in 1974, when Congress and Nixon were uh, fighting over whether Nixon could withhold or impound uh, appropriations that President Nixon thought was too much, 
there was an anti-impoundment act that was passed by Congress that declared that any president that tried to do that uh, committed an impeachable offense and could be impeached for that. So, you know, particularly when we get to September 30th, which is the end of the fiscal year, you see all these agencies that haven't spent all of their money go off on a spending spree for things that they don't want. The Impoundment Act should be repealed. Now, Trump is talking about sending rescission bills to Congress because of the bloated spending that was in this uh, omnibus appropriation bill uh, that was passed about a month ago. I voted against it as did Congressman Grothman, um, you know, on our side of the aisle. So we stood up to our leadership and said, you know, hey, time out, you know, this is much too much and we're digging ourselves a hole and we're doing something that's immoral because we are making our children and grandchildren ending up paying for the money that we are spending on ourselves. And borrowing all this money to do what I've just described is exactly that. And I think that's immoral, and I don't think that members of Congress should be doing that. So if uh, President Trump uh, sends rescission to Congress, I am going to be a very enthusiastic eye. I kind of doubt it will pass, but at least we can get a roll call on who wants to waste money and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, the state, you mentioned about the state level also. So this year we passed what's called a zero-based budgeting measure. In the past, our state has always been, has always done baseline budgeting, which means if your budget was, you know, 10 million this year, you started at 10 million and increased from there. With zero-based budgeting, the agencies have to basically start at zero and prove that every program that they're doing is worthwhile. And it's a way to stop the automatic growth in government, and it'll help us be able to focus in a little bit better. So going forward, you, you should be saying some uh, improvements at the state level. Yeah, but they against me as a federal and the state always said that they're going to go through and, and take out all the wasteful spending. Everybody said it for years. Nobody's <laughs> done it. Nobody stood up to anything and said Ms. Krieger, what a politician says doesn't mean anything. How a politician votes <laughs> does. <laughs> and my votes are there, you know. I stood up against a lot of people who come into these meetings saying you can't cut a dime out of the growth rate of my program. And um, with the baseline budgeting, say you're spending $10 million on a program this year, and the people who run the program uh, ask for 15. Now, the way we were all taught math in the second and third grade, that's a $15 million or $5 million increase, right? Okay. <laughs> Well, say the President and the Congress cut it back to 12. Now that is sold to the American public and the news media is complicit in that as a $3 billion cut rather than the $2 million increase, which it actually is, the way we were taught math in grade school. And a lot of my colleagues don't stand up and tell it as it is, saying you're getting $2 million more, we've got a big debt, we've got a big deficit, and you ought to tighten your belt a little bit for your children and grandchildren. Uh, they say, oh, we don't care about that. You know, we need the money now. You give us the money now, we'll spend it now, and we'll come back next year for more. Ron Anderson, South 93rd Street. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, the State Department is our first line of defense. And people don't realize how much it is. Now, I'm wondering if this new man that's going to be a State Department, if he'll be able to stand up to Trump. Well, you know, the, the Constitution gives the President the authority to run foreign policy. And if uh, you were here and heard the conversation that I had, you know, with these folks from uh, Anglophone Cameroon when they were talking to me about the problems in their homeland, you know, part of the problem was is that when Tillerson was Secretary of State, he wanted to run the State Department like he ran Exxon Mobil, you know, where his word is the law. And he didn't get help, meaning the assistant secretaries who are also appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate for areas, you know, like uh, Latin America, Africa, Europe, the Middle East, and the like. Um, and because Tillerson was in over his head, Trump fired him, and he should have fired him, uh, because that management style was not working. 
uh, Mr. Pompeo, you know, is close to Trump. I will be the first one to say that. And Trump uh, trusts him implicitly because even though he has not been confirmed as Secretary of State, he's still the CIA director. And Trump sent him over to North Korea over Easter weekend. And there seemed to be a lot of progress made as a result of those very secret negotiations that he made with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. Uh, so the Constitution gives the president almost plenary authority in running uh, foreign policy, as the ambassador's clause is interpreted by the Supreme Court. The president ought to have his man or his woman in running you know, the State Department. And if things don't work out, Mr. Trump made a name for himself long before he became president by appearing on TV and saying, you're fired. Uh, uh, Patrick Sterling, South 69th Street. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I have a few questions, but the most important one, I guess the one that bothers me the most is, uh, I just read that California wants to start banning books, and I can't think of anything on America. You're right. What can we do to bring those guys back and show more perfect human? <laughs> well, the first thing we need to do is ban sanctuary cities and ban sanctuary states. You know, and if the governor and legislature in California you know, want to make political statements to appeal to their base, then they ought to be cut off of federal funding. That will get them back to reality pretty quickly because most local and state governments receive an awful lot of money from the federal government. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure they'll run off to court, but Congress under the Constitution does have the power of the purse. And we can pass a bill that shuts off the funding for sanctuary cities. The House has. The Senate has to have the guts to do it. Uh, so, you know, therein lies the problem. And that the question on sanctuary cities should properly be directed to our two senators because we have done our job in stopping sanctuary city funding. And, you know, it ought to be stopped. And, you know, I, I read a lot of history. You know, that's one of my pastimes. And if you look back to uh, what led up to the Civil War, you had the southern states attempting to nullify, quotes around that, laws that the federal government had passed. And it completely ignored the supremacy clause of the Constitution. Uh, they, so the southern states you know, said that they could pass their own laws largely protecting slavery and the economics of slavery, uh, which uh, the vast majority of citizens of the United States opposed because most of the population were in the northern free states. We fought a war over this issue, and now history is repeating itself. And I don't think that the American public should allow that to happen because the only thing uh, attempted nullifications of federal laws, whether it's on sanctuary cities or anything else will lead to, unless it's stopped in its tracks, and the sooner the better, is further division between the U.S. and the state governments, and then we will no longer be a United States of America. Now, I sure as hell hope that we do not you know, have another civil war over this, but we've already had one once, and I think it was Churchill that said that those who do not learn the mistakes of history are bound to repeat them. By the way, I, uh, my undergraduate degree was from Stanford, so I lived out there for four years. And my car was parked when I took my last exam, and I walked out of there, fired the car up, and drove east, <laughs> never to return. <laughs> and that was a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, Robert was <laughs> Dallas Bow of West Greenfield Avenue in West Dallas. Mr. Dallas Bow. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, do you think there's any validity to the war on marijuana, or is that just one big hoax? Well, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, marijuana, you know, there is a federal law that has that as a controlled substance. Uh, the Justice Department announced that they were not going to enforce it, which was kind of overruling what Attorney General Sessions uh, would say. Uh, there are a few states, but not all of them, that uh, uh, have 
legalize marijuana either for medical purposes as a way of treating pain and or for recreational purposes. I am for legalizing marijuana for medical purposes. You know, my, my wife of 42, 41 years, you know, has had chronic pain. You know, there are a lot of doctors that say that this uh, doesn't help at all from a clinical standpoint. At least people uh, who have chronic pain ought to be allowed to try it. And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, they can try to figure out some other way that manages it. Joe? So from the state level, we've looked at, um, you know, we, we legalized the CBD oil uh, a couple of sessions ago. Um, the way I look at it is I don't see a lot of scientific facts that say that marijuana really is helpful. In fact, there's more data out there that says it's more harmful, whether it's harming DNA, increasing lung failure. Um, I mean, there's just a host of studies out there that, that say that it's very detrimental to the health. So until, uh, and including the uh, Wisconsin Medical Society, who does not approve of it either. And, and their position is until we can see some proven research that shows that it's effective and helps without harming people more than it helps them, and they also want to see a smokeless uh, variety of, of cannabis to help for pain, and that's kind of the position that I'm in. When the experts in the field are telling us it's too dangerous, yet then I side with the experts. Uh, Greg Jackson of Haven Wood Court in Brookfield. Right here. Okay. Uh, I was glad to hear that your fiscal concern would be bad, as am I, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I just don't see this tax bill uh, uh, fulfilling that promise of being fiscally conservative. We're talking about everything I read, Congressional Budget Office, Joint Taxation Commission say it's going to be a billion to two billion dollar deficit for the for over a 10 year period. So I, I don't understand uh, uh, why it was formatted and done the way it was. In addition, I personally uh, have in excess, past several years, of 24,000 in, in standard deductions. Mm -hmm. And you're eliminating the personal exemption, which is a loss to me of $8,000, which is a tax increase to me of $800. Mm -hmm. So winners and losers were picked in this tax framework. And I'm a loser, and I know others who are losers. And I don't consider myself a wealthy person when my when my tax taxable oh, my adjusted gross is around sixty to seventy thousand dollars per year. I'm retired, so I, how is this helping me? How is it helping the country? Let's talk about the country first. Uh, the idea of lowering rates and stimulating the economy was first uh, put forth by President Kennedy. So it was not a Republican idea in 1962. And there, were, the tax marginal tax rate reduced was reduced from 91 to 70 percent. Money went flowing into the federal government's coffers, particularly through capital gains taxes, because capital gains taxes are voluntary taxes unless you have to sell in order to raise, you know, cash to pay your bills. You know, if you sit on the capital gain, uh, you don't have to pay any tax on that. When Reagan reduced it in two stages, first from 70 to 50 and then to 28 percent, during the 10-year period uh, after these tax rates kicked, new tax rates kicked in, the individual income tax collections of the federal government doubled. And Bush did the same thing and there was an increase in uh, federal income tax collections. The reason you get the figures from uh, the CBO and the OMB is they are required by law to have what is called flat budget scoring rather than dynamic scoring. So the estimates that they have to give to Congress are saying if there is a billion and a half in a tax revenue loss by using last year's tax collections and then applying the percentage reduction that is contained in the new law, that's what they uh, state as the figure rather than what is caused dynamic scoring, which ends up, you know, looking at uh, how much more money would be collected by economic growth, uh, people cashing in on capital gains and, and the voluntary tax, and in the case of the lowering of the corporate tax rates, uh, the amount of money that would be brought back by American corporations 
that have kept money overseas because their repatriation tax rate was 35 percent and that was reduced to about 10 percent for two years and then 21 percent. I'll give you the example of Apple. You know, Apple decided they were going to repatriate about $360 billion to the world away overseas and invest that in the United States. That's 20,000 new high tech. It depends high upon what you say invest. Uh, uh, well, you know, uh, the other side uses the word invest for spending. Government you know, spending. I, I'm just saying some investment is, is well, what they what what Apple said, you know, is they were going to build new factories and hire 20,000 people. And if you work for Apple, these are fairly good paying jobs. Yeah. Um, you know, this is not the minimum wage job of flipping hamburgers at McDonald's um, on that. And that they estimate that they will pay $38 billion more in federal corporate income tax at the low rates, which never would have been collected had the rates stayed high and they kept that money overseas. Now that's just, you know, one, uh, one corporation. It probably will be the best example and the repatriation will be much lower amounts for other corporations, but this, you know, shows what, what the issue is. Now, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, state and local tax deductions, which were repealed, and our state and local taxes are about in the middle of amongst our states, most but not all people will be able to cut or eliminate their losses because unless you make a million dollars or more, the alternative minimum tax is repealed on that. And if you pull out what your AMT cost is, you know, which is at your full rate, you know, rather than a deduction, you know, of an amount which, you know, probably will be at about, you know, a third plus or minus on that, you will see that uh, any change from state to local tax or repeal, you know, is going to be significantly cushioned if not eliminated. Where you're hearing the squawking uh, most loudly is from the governors of New York and New Jersey who have the highest uh, state and local taxes in the country. They were very opposed to the tax bill uh, 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 and, and didn't like it, but you know, now they're asking Congress to give them some relief. Uh, 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 support is a two-way street, Governor Cuomo. But it, uh, you didn't address the fact that it impacts me specifically, yeah. and it increases my taxes and people like. Well, me. I, you know, I don't, I don't know how much an alternative minimum tax you pay. You know, I don't pay alternative minimum. Tax. Okay, well then, if you don't, it will increase your taxes. It, it definitely you know how, you know. However, you know what I can say is most people with large state and local tax deductions, uh, you know, and remember. State and local taxes are a preference that kicks in the alternative minimum tax. You know, all the deductions you take except charitable contributions under the old law, you know, were preferences and you have to pay an alternative minimum tax on the preference that you had. So, you know, if the alternative minimum tax ended up kicking in for you, you know, that uh, you know, that uh, $16,000 that you were able to write off would be taxed at your regular rate. You know, there, you know, I will say that in the 5th District of Wisconsin, 97% you know, of the people will get a tax cut which will average about $2,800. You know, okay? so one of the 3%. Percent, and losers were yeah, yeah, but you know, when I'm looking at something in this congressional district that I represent, 97 to 3, you know, is pretty overwhelming. And, and the idea of reducing taxes and increasing revenues, uh, at what point doesn't that continue to occur? Because ultimately, if you do that, there's no taxes and no revenues. Where is the magic line? Well, you know, what I can say is, is that, you know, there was a major tax reduction for corporations. I'll admit that. That was necessary because we have the largest national corporate income tax of any industrialized country in the world. And what that was doing was encouraging all of these corporate inversions where a company like Johnson Controls ends up saying, we're no longer an American corporation, our head office is in Ireland, which has a 12.5% corporate tax rate. So you know, unless the board wants to get sued by the shareholders for paying too much in taxes, and there's some boards that have done that, that's something you know, that our tax law encouraged. As far as the individual tax reductions were concerned, you know, the race did not go down an awful lot. 
you know, the top rate went from uh, 39 to 37. Their, their rate went down. But their rate went down, and your rate went down too, and there were people... But the net effect is... At the, the bottom down. end. But, you know, most of the people, you know, who have got big state and local tax deductions, I you know, and, and end up paying a big yeah. alternative minimum tax. You're one of the exceptions. Well, I know two others, friends of mine, that are okay. exceptions. Mike Arnie, St. Charles, and Wauwatosa. Yes, uh, hi. Um, I had a couple things. Uh, one was I see that you're working on uh, the reauthorization of the Second Chance Act, and I wanted to hear your thoughts about that and whether that's going to go through. It sounded like a good bipartisan. Well, we've had the Second Chance Act for 10 years, and the Second Chance Act has been uh, sponsored by Representative Danny Davis, who is an African-American congressman from the west side of Chicago and myself, and it was originally passed with signed by President Bush. Um, there are some of the programs that were authorized that were found not to be useful. The reauthorization bill, which Representative Davis and I have sponsored, you know, basically gets rid of the ones that have worked and sends the money into the program that doesn't. And the Second Chance Act is basically a law that deals with people who are released from federal prison uh, to make sure or attempt to make sure that they don't reoffend. Uh, and of the people that have gone through the Second Chance Act, uh, they have a 43% success rate, you know, whereas the reoffending rate uh, is also about 43%. So if we make it bigger and better, the chances of reoffending and, you know, somebody getting out of prison, hanging out with the people that got them in trouble in the first place and going back uh, to prison is much, much greater. You know, I am all for this. You know, I am trying to persuade uh, the leadership in the House uh, to get this out of committee as a standalone bill rather than getting this involved in all kinds of prison reform and sentencing reform, which I am also for. Uh, but I don't think that putting the Second Chance Act in with the other stuff is going to get one additional vote and it's going to slow it down. So prying it loose, getting it passed, the Senate will pass it, we can put it on the President's desk, at least we've got that part of the three-legged stool of what to do with people who get in trouble and are convicted of offenses, uh, make that one firm leg. Now, you know, in order to get it uh, uh, working the way it should, you need three legs on the stool, but at least there will be one down and two to go. So, so you think the chances are pretty good it'll make don't, it up? Don't know yet. You know, I can tell you that uh, I had a meeting with a number of more junior congressmen uh, that was presided over by Jared Kushner. And when Mr. Kushner starts talking about how important all three legs in the school, the stool are, you know he's talking for his father-in-law. <laughs> okay, uh, the other thing I want to ask about was, uh, it's Earth Day today, I wondered what your thoughts were about that. It was, of course, created by Gaylord Nelson, a Democrat, but it, it led to the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts, which were signed into law by President Nixon. I wondered if you just had any thoughts about that, because what I like about it is that it was it seemed to have led to some legislation that was bipartisan, and um, I think we could use more of that along the lines of your second chance work. Well, uh, both the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act, you know, have been funded in, in this omnibus bill, and, um, uh, you, know, you know, there we're talking more about funding than, you know, actual uh, uh, provisions of the law being tinkered around with. The one thing that I do need I think does need to be addressed is we ought to get rid of ethanol mandates in the fuel because they hurt the environment. You know, the environmental community was originally all for ethanol because it's a renewable fuel, but you look at how much water it wrecks to make it, and the fact that, you know, if you use ethanol laced fuel in your gas tank, uh, your gas mileage goes down, and there are a lot of other pollutants that go out of the tailpipe. You know, I could talk personally, for example, you know, uh, two of the counties in this district are uh, Dodge and Jefferson County. They don't have a reformulated gas mandate out there. And when I get my car filled up out there, I get 10 miles per gallon more in the summer and 15 miles per gallon more in the winter. Uh, that means, in my opinion, less pollution. But, you know, the Clean Air Act mandate, you know, requires that we have reformulated gas and ethanol. And I think that both of those things are ideas whose time should never have come, but has come and gone now. 
And we ought to recognize that fact that the science has advanced, but the law has not. Thank you. Uh, Mike Antojovitz, Cold Spring in New Berlin. Yep. Uh, if I can have more than one question, I'd appreciate it. But first of all, I'd like to say thank you for having these meetings. Uh, thank you. It, it's appreciated, and you yeah, obviously know your stuff. Uh, first question I got is, is, how do I go about getting a law passed? Well, uh, we have a brochure that we can send you about how a bill becomes law. Uh, I've got your address. We'll be glad to send it to you. That's the easy part, you know, what is taught in high school civics and how the Constitution is set up. You know, getting bills out of committee, getting bills scheduled, getting them passed by both houses is a major feat. And I think the biggest problem to getting good laws passed, the bad laws should be killed, but getting good laws passed, you know, is the filibuster rule in the Senate. Because you can have a filibuster that requires 60 votes. And a group of senators, whether it's all of one party or a group of senators that feel the same way on another bill, you know, can simply deny the 60 votes and the Senate cannot even do <coughs> a motion to take it up. And the Senate also has got an anonymous rule that allows a single senator to anonymously put a hold on a bill. So you, a senator can be over there and say, I don't like this bill, and put a hold on it and the leadership on both sides accepts that uh, on that. Now, when people figure out which senator put a hold on it, you know, and the heat gets put on them because the bill is popular, then wink, wink, nod, nod, they'll tap one of their friends on the shoulder and say, I can't put a hold on it anymore. You put an anonymous hold on it. And I can tell you that, you know, maybe 20 years ago, I was giving a speech to the National Convention of the Broadcasters on a copyright issue. And I was on the side of the broadcasters. And on the opposite side was Ted Stevens, who was a very cantankerous senator from Alaska. And I got up and I said, why the bill you want passed is good policy and, you know, why it helps stimulate the economy. And I got a good round of applause. And Stevens gets up and says, well, you know, there's some problems with it. There's this and there's that and there's that and there's this. And this bill's not ready for prime time. And we got to look at it a little bit more. But I don't know when I'm going to have the time to schedule it. Red, red I'm going to kill this bill, you know, simply by letting time run out on it. So the president of the National Broadcasters, I think he was a broadcaster somewhere in Nevada, got up and said, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner, would you like to respond to that? And I said, you have just learned why we think that the United States Senate is the Committee on Legislative Constipation. Everything goes in and nothing comes out. <laughs> Stevens gets up and says, that was a cheap shot. And I responded, it was intended to be. That bill passed, but it required somewhat of an insult uh, uh, to the one who is causing the problem. Okay, so in short, do I contact you to get the insults going? <laughs> <laughs> if you would like me to insult you now, I would be good too, but I'm getting at I'm getting, if you I'm, have an you idea, brochure, right? If you, if you have an idea for a bill, you know, let my office know and we'll take a look at it. All right, and the second thing I got, it's real quick, you know, we all, any of us goes to court and they swear you in, you have to tell the truth and so forth, and the oath of, uh, mm -hmm. whatever the oath is called. And I know that government officials in general take oaths of office. Yep. I know that, you know, for me, if I go to court, it never happened, but if I was to go to court and testify under oath, and if I lie, that's called perjury. Yes. And what do they call it when an elected, when any, any government official violates their oath of office? Well, first of all, as far as violating an oath of office is concerned, you know, an elected government official, the remedy for that is the next election. If an uh, elected government official, such as a congressman or somebody in the cabinet, ends up committing perjury, the Justice Department can but doesn't have to prosecute them. Uh, and uh, I think as we have found lying to the FBI, you know, it's something that has sent a lot of government officials in and out of Congress to jail uh, on this. But that's completely up to the Justice Department. 
Now, the Justice Department, for political reasons, can decide to stonewall a prosecution. I'll give you an example. Uh, about three years ago, when I found out that the NSA was eavesdropping on American citizens without a warrant, uh, which goes against my grain in the fact that, you know, the Fourth Amendment is supposed to protect our privacy, uh, there were a number of hearings that were held, and I eventually got, you know, the law changed on it, but it took a lot of hemming and hawing. James Clapper, who at that time was the National Intelligence Director in the Obama White House, lied to the United States Senate. You know, and it was obvious perjury, and he didn't attempt to correct it. You know, if you make a mistake in your testimony and correct it shortly thereafter, you're not going to be prosecuted for that, because anybody can make a mistake, particularly, you know, when you're under the gun and you don't know what's going to be asked uh, uh, on that, and your memory can, can fail you on it. Right. Clapper lied. You know, there are a bunch of us, myself included, that wrote the Justice Department and say this man ought to be prosecuted for lying to Congress. You know, and we swear our witnesses in uh, before they testify before any committee. And even if we don't swear the witnesses in, if they lie to us, you know, they're subject to lying to Congress, which is a federal felony. Justice Department refused to prosecute Clapper. You know, he you know, left the Obama administration when it left office, and we now see his talking head very frequently on television, expressing his opinions about the current administration. You know, the guy is a self-admitted liar. He should be required to pay the penalty for that. You know, and if you don't force people to tell the truth, either in court or before Congress, then, you know, the standard of truthful testimony for everybody else gets lowered. And Congress and the courts can only make proper decisions based upon truthful testimony. And the less likely the testimony is that it is truthful, the more likely it is that you're going to be mistakes made, either as a miscarriage of justice in court or a law passed that uh, uh, was really not in the public interest. Well, I Googled it, and I was just looking for the word, but Google says it's either perjury if, if a government official, I'm not necessarily elected, it's either perjury or it's a form of treason. Is there a word for when a government official breaks the oath of office? Uh, you know, the answer to that question is no. Uh, treason is specifically defined in the Constitution as giving aid and comfort the enemies and it must be corroborated by two witnesses and it's the only crime that is specifically defined in the Constitution and what is necessary to prove that someone is guilty of that crime. Okay, so there's no word. If we, if we commit perjury, we, we know what it is. But if a governmental official, elected or not, commits perjury, we don't know what it is when they break their oath. If they lie well, perjury and breaking your oath are two different things. That's what I'm trying yeah, to figure per out. Perjury is lying under oath Correct. or making a false statement to a government investigative authority, such as the FBI, on um, that. That is a separate crime, and the Justice Department decides whether or not to prosecute that individual. You know, the, the, the current person who pled out to perjury is Michael Flynn, or not to perjury, but lied to the FBI. You know, he's been convicted. All wrong, okay. Yeah, he, you know, he's been convicted, and he's going to be sentenced sometime in the near future. You know, breaking your oath is, you know, very subjective on that. You know, the oath says that you will preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic that you take this oath freely and without purpose of uh, mental evasion or deception, and that you will well and faithfully discharge the oath of or the duties of the office of which you are about to enter. And that oath is given to everybody but the president, and he takes a separate oath that's in the Constitution uh, on that. So, you know, first of all, you've got the question, you know, of whether you're not preserving, protecting, and defending the Constitution of the United States. The second is whether you're aiding and abetting an enemy, foreign and domestic. And remember, in order to convict anybody of anything, you've got to convince 12 people on the jury beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, the defendant committed the crime. And as I've just described this to you, uh, you know, there are enough ways that any clever defense lawyer, and maybe even defense lawyers that aren't so clever, are going to be able to poke a hole in it. 
Now, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I will never vote for a bill that I honestly believe is unconstitutional, because I think that breaks my oath of office. But I'm me, I have my own standards. Everybody else who serves in Congress, I'm sure has as many different standards as there are as many other representatives and senators. So there's no word for it. Well, <laughs> no. <there's, laughs> That's what I'm going to know. Yeah. I didn't want that. that, was that, that, that yeah, but more importantly, there's no time for it either. That's a problem. I think. And again, it gets to my point that you know, if you think somebody is consistently breaking his oath of office, yeah. you know, the remedy is political. You know, go defeat that person, elect somebody else in the next election. Thank you. That means that everybody, every voter has got you know, responsibility to basically reach their own conclusion on the question. Uh, Barry, is it Brazon, uh, Weatherstone, and Merlin? Yeah, Barry Brazon. Yeah. Um, just a question, this is sort of uh, related to the environment. There's a proposed bill, H.R. 4647, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Mm -hmm. I just read about it. I don't know if you're familiar. No, I haven't read about it. No. We've got over 5,000 bills introduced in the House. Right. It just, I happened to read about it in the paper, yeah. and it sounds like a good idea. It would uh, distribute some uh, government funds to all states to focus on the health of non-game species. Uh, Wisconsin would benefit, uh, they estimate, by about $22 million a year. Okay, now how, how, much is the, how much is the total federal appropriation on that? For the whole thing? For the whole thing. Um, you know that? I think it was $1.3 billion. Okay. And this was coming from oil and gas lease. It, that, that's a bad deal for Wisconsin. How and so? the reason is, is we've got about 2.5% of the national population. And if the total federal pot you know, gets us back less than two and a half percent of what our population is. Then we send money into Washington that gets redistributed elsewhere. You know, as far as I'm concerned, taxes are too high in this state. We shouldn't get the chump change from Washington. And that means opposing these kinds of bills, letting the state take its responsibility. And that way we're sure that a hundred cents out of every dollar that is collected from the people of Wisconsin is spent here. Um, that's true. Uh, however, with the administration both in the U.S. government and in the state cutting back a lot of funds that are protecting the environment, this seems like something that you could throw a bone to us that, that want to see the environment protected. Well, now, now listen, sir. I have three rescue dogs at home. <laughs> but they know the size of bones. They know very well the size of bones. And I think the voters of this state don't think that they're getting a big bone that might be advertised in, uh, on what this bill is, and instead get one that's about this big. My dogs get very angry when that's the only bone they get. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it says it's coming from oil and gas lease. If it goes into the general fund, then it gets distributed. Is that the general, general fund? Yes, it goes into the general fund. It's not a segregated fund. Okay, so you're against this type of thing. I'm against things where we get the chump change back. Okay. And you know, every once in a while you'll hear people running around saying our delegation, you know, is not uh, alert enough and you know, we get back a very low amount of the amount of money we send into Washington. You take the fence out of that because that's a national uh, kind of thing. And you know, I'm not going to uh, fall into that trap when they run around saying the delegation isn't doing their job because we're not getting back our fair share. So I look at fair shares. Okay, so not that you want to help the environment, but fair share is more important. No, I want to, you know, I do the same thing on highways. You know, there's a lot more money involved in that. It's not that I don't want to help the environment. You know, what I can say is, is that this is a conservation-minded state and you know, we ought to spend the money that we raise in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, on projects in Wisconsin. Period. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is it Lynn Stowe, Stowe, Pine Street, Economy Wall? That would be me. Thank Go ahead. you. So thank you for also for the meeting. I appreciate it. Um, I am concerned and have a question about um, the rollout with the 5G. Um, and um, the cell towers that they're predicting will um, come every two to ten homes across our communities. Um, and who we already know that the telecommunications 
industry has um, preempted themselves from the health um, liability of this. So who will be liable for the medical costs that will or have already increased because of the radiation that's coming from cell phones? And we know the cell towers are at least 100 times more emitting of radiation than the cell phones. Well, you know, the federal law on cell towers is basically this that if the community allows a cell tower of one provider into the community, then they have to open it up to the competition. This is the 5G. Well, okay. Okay. I'm telling you what the federal law is, okay. whether it's 5G or 10 years from now, 20G. If they open it up to a cell tower of one uh, provider, they have to open it up to every provider. And the reason for that is to prevent a local community from establishing a monopoly within its borders. And that is a good law. Competition keeps the price down on this. Now, as far as zoning is concerned, uh, until about two years ago or three years ago, and I'm going to defer to Mr. Sanfilippo in a minute, um, local governments had complete zoning authority over whether to give conditional use permits for things like cell towers on that. The state passed a law that took away the zoning authority of the state governments, um, uh, the state government for that. Now there was a bill in, in the last session of the legislature that passed the assembly, but I don't know what happened to it in the Senate, that said that every cell tower in the state had to be located far enough away from any residence or commercial building. So if the cell tower went down, it would not hit the building. So that meant that if the cell tower was 200 feet tall, it had to be more than 200 feet away from any building on where the company wanted to locate the cell tower. So let me defer to Representative Sanfilippo now. So as Congressman Sensenbrenner pointed out, uh, was I believe two sessions ago where the law was changed and taking the authority away from the local level and it was because there were several complaints that came to the state that some municipalities were basically blackmailing cell phone companies uh, to get them to pay for all sorts of things including one county who uh, wanted the cell phone company to build all sorts of public bathrooms in a park in exchange for permission to get a cell tower. So, uh, and that has problems, as the congressman said, because it picks winners and losers, right, and stuff, and prevents competition. The legislature overreacted uh, by taking away the local authority because it was a big mistake and it was something that I didn't support. In fact, myself and all of the local representatives, both in West Dallas and New Berlin, <coughs> wrote the governor a uh, letter and asked him to veto that out of the budget. It was put in the budget process because there was a problem that needed to be fixed, but this was not the way to go about doing it. Uh, the bill that Congressman Sensenbrenner just brought up was sponsored by uh, Representative Allen in this past legislative session. We did pass it in the Assembly. We tend to have the same constipation problem at the Senate at the local <laughs> level as that they have at the federal level, and then a lot of things we passed didn't get through. So it got hung up in the Senate and never made it out of the Senate. Representative Allen has said that he will bring it back up again next session and will continue to work on those types of issues to allow more of that control. This is not the cell towers that I'm talking about. The cell towers that I'm talking about are going to go on top of um, our lights, our street lights, as well as about small this cell. hall. That's right. Small That's cell towers small that are, cell. are actually planned to go every two to ten homes across our communities. And it's already done in several states. They've got rollouts going on. And what are we, who's going to be medically responsible? Because we know Tim Cook, who is of the telecom, and the one that actually brought back all of the money from Apple, who's making $200 million but can't make a, self, uh, a safe cell phone where our children are getting brain cancer as well as adults are. And we have a small cell tower in Oconomowoc right in front of the high school, which is like the most vulnerable population. This is, this is absurd that we've allowed the telecommunications co companies to really snowball and actually take over our rights, and our I, health and rights. Can I ask what level of government authorized uh, that cell tower to be built for your uh, According, I'm going to be speaking with our council people, but according to them, that's where it, it came from. But they're being forced by upper levels to bring in 5G technology or else be left out. But, you know, you know, the 5G is going in and there's, there are 
Well, it places all your, of your your complaint is really with the Conwalk City Council. No, it's not. It's with all. It's with. Okay, so how are you going to vote on the now Act S19 and the Digit Act, Act S88? And also any smart bills that Maybe go... Neither of them have passed the Senate, and we can't yes. vote on bills that haven't passed the Senate. They have. Both of them have. They have. Well, yes, I will look have. at them when they, come, when they come out. You know, one of the things that throughout my public career I have been very insistent on is keeping local control over zoning. Because it's, you know, it's the local people that know best. People can come out and talk to a city council or a town or village board. They're elected officials. And... Uh, you know, I can tell you that, you know, I live in Menominee Falls and this issue, you know, was the big issue in the village president election that we had earlier this month there. Uh, uh, Isn't the village getting sued in your town? Because yes, they they're were... getting, you know, they're, they're, get, they're getting sued, but this was the big issue. But, in the but they're getting sued from a communication company that feels that they have the right to have a cell tower and in a damaging area, a residential area. Yeah. Yes. I will defend the right of any village, whether it's mine or anyone else in the country, to, to be able to attempt to zone things out, whether it's a cell tower or anything else. That's where the decision should be made. Then why, why would a local community be sued by a telecommunications company for the right to place their cell tower? Because they're actually saying to communities that they have the right through the FCC to do 5G small towers, cell towers, anywhere they want. Okay, filing a lawsuit is different than winning it. But it costs a lot of money for cities to have to defend hey, listen, stuff listen, like that. You know, it's my property taxes that pay for it. There's nobody here that lives in Menominee Falls. And, you know, I live in the park, uh, you know, well, where uh, the falls where uh, they wanted to put the cell tower up. Now, you know, the FCC is an independent agency. Uh, that know. is also, and everybody that's employed in there, or most of the people, Verizon, past lobbyists for telecommunications industry. Well, they're appointed by the president and confirmed by the But Senate. what I'm saying that they're and actually a the bought people, representative. Ma'am. Who's appointed most of the, the majority of the commissioners on the FCC? I'm sure it is Bill Clinton was the one that passed the FCC, that allowed the FCC to actually put in it yeah. that they were not responsible and for I health. I still think there's a majority of Obama appointments on the FCC. I, I am not, this is not a partisan issue. This is a health issue for everyone. It's a privacy well, issue. Well, ma'am, I can say issue. that the, issue, the health issue has been debated in Congress. Are you They're, kidding me? It has not. Okay, ma'am, I'm not going to answer your question. All I said was it's been debated in Congress. I think I'm going to move on now because anything I say you're going to argue with. So next up is Breck Renzelman. Of Thank Bob you Lord so Ryan much for your consideration, Fox, sir. Fox yeah. Point. Well, you know, I told you, ma'am, that I that interruptions, you know, were out of bounds. But I you think know, that if it, it's an interruption. I didn't interrupt you. You interrupted me every time I said something. Mr. But you, you know what? As long as you Mr. don't Mr. like what the person says. Could you please either sit down or leave the room? All right. Thank you. You've been warned several times, Mr. Renzelman. I actually agree with what she's saying, but that's not my question. Mm -hmm. And by the way, thank you for raising the ethanol issue. Mm -hmm. you know, I've had the same experience as you described, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's a boondoggle that needs to be pulled down, mm -hmm. not be supported in the same way that it has been. But my question is on a totally different topic. Sure. Would you support the right of Palestinians to peacefully protest? I think everybody ought to peacefully protest. However, it is subjective on what is peaceful, you know, uh, you know, lobbying grenades, you know, across the border between the Gaza and Israel is not peaceful. Uh, you know, the Israelis have said get back from the border. Some of the Palestinians have, some of them haven't. Uh, but, you know, Israel has got the right to protect its own territory, you know, including from stuff that is explosives that are tossed across the fence. Well, what has been happening every Friday leading up to, uh, as part of the right to return to their homes, march protests that, that they've started, they are being picked off by Israeli military with snipers, peaceful protesters, shooting children in the head. Well, Dozens are dead, thousands are injured, and we are sending money to the Israeli government. We are arming them. 
We so send we, money to the Palestinians too. We don't send them three billion. A year. Not a sir. What did, I, what did I say about interruptions? We don't send them three billion. Either a year. sit down. I will leave. You don't need to order me out. And you don't need to interrupt either, Mr. Ransom. Three billion a year is a lot more than we give to the Palestinians. And in fact, because there was pullback on some of the refugee funding through the UN that was threatened by our government. I mean, it's just pittance compared to three billion. Well, you know what? What I can say is that there's no Israeli government that would agree to a peace treaty that gave Palestinians the, the right of return, which means that they would be able to, you know, basically go uh, into territory that was in Israel right from the beginning, meaning before the state of Israel was created, and basically take the land away from uh, the Israelis that have settled it uh, since then. Now, you know, what I can say is, you know, back during the Y River negotiations, which was when Arafat was still alive, and I believe uh, Ehud uh, Barut, or whatever his name was, was the Prime Minister of Israel, they couldn't have gotten them to an agreement. And then Arafat stuck the right of return on the table. And there is no way that Israel, in a, a democracy, uh, would ever agree to that. And even if the prime minister agreed with that, it would have been overwhelmingly voted down in the Knesset, which is what they call, you know, their parliament. So, you know, the thing is, is the, uh, you know, the, the Palestinians are going to have to get real on this. You know, now every U.S. government since, uh, President Carter, you know, has supported, you know, a two-state solution to the problem, you know, where there would be a state of Israel and a Palestinian state. But uh, uh, where the hang-up has been is more with the Palestinians on what the Palestinian state um, should consist of, because Gaza is controlled by Hamas and the West Bank is controlled uh, by Hezbollah. Right now they're living in an open-air prison. It's not a democracy in Israel for anyone. <laughs> but I was there during the last election. They were fighting the thing out tooth and nail there. And there was no guarantee that Netanyahu and his party would be able to win. And then it took a couple of months for him to put together a coalition after the election was over with. You know, that's probably the only functional democracy in the Middle East, you know, where there's a healthy debate between the government and the opposition. And when there's an election and a turnover of power, it happens. Well, I wouldn't think that if you if you met a Palestinian, I don't think that you would get that same picture. But they are treated as full citizens. Well, uh, you know what I can say is is that uh, you know the Palestinians on the West Bank, you know, they're under military occupation. Uh, the Palestinians in Gaza, uh, the Israelis withdrew from Gaza. They are not under military obligation. They offered to give them back to Egypt, which governed Gaza. Uh, before the 67 war, and Egypt didn't want them. But they, they are denied access to some of the basic functions of sewage, water, lights, power. Well, uh, you know, all I can say is, is how are you going to get that when you start uh, tossing bombs and RPGs and grenades across the fence? But these protests these that are rolling out every Friday are peaceful. There are no grenades. None of them are armed. Not all of them have been peaceful. And the Israelis have asked people to step back from the border. And, you know, they, to my knowledge, the Israelis have not been attacking the people that have stepped back from the border. They're attacking the people that are. Who are unarmed. How do you know they're unarmed? That's the reports we're hearing. Well, you can keep putting a grenade in your pocket and. Nobody would see it until you pull it out and pull the pin. Including children. Listen, there have been a lot of children that have been involved in various intifadas, too. Well, when you look at the history of the creation of Israel, you have to look at what happened to the Palestinian people from the start. They call it Nakba, the catastrophe. They lost their homes. They started they seven driven. wars and lost them all. I'm talking 1948. Uh, when the state of Israel was proclaimed, yes. the Arabs wanted to militarily push them to the sea. And all of the other wars were all started by the Arabs. So when you say Arab, that's not a unified group. No, Arabs are 
historically are never unified. I mean, there are Palestinian Jews, mm -hmm. as well as Palestinian Christians. None of this is unified in that sense of Arab versus Israel. It's not that. Thank you. Uh, Tata Mentan, uh, Minneapolis. Yeah. This is the transfer of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. As you see with the process of peace. Well, uh, Congress passed the law in '96, which Clinton signed, that said that the embassy should be re relocated to Jerusalem. Um, no president before Trump has decided to do that. Trump did that. You know, and as far as I am concerned, uh, you know, any country has the right to state what its capital is. And we should have our diplomatic representation present in the capital. You know, it would be, you know, kind of like, you know, Washington being our capital and every, every one of the embassies was in Chicago. That doesn't make any sense at all in terms of the diplomatic relationship that foreign countries would have with us because that's where the business is done. And the same thing is true in Israel. You know, all government offices are in Jerusalem. The parliament's uh, in Jerusalem. The prime minister and president's office, you know, are in Jerusalem. So why shouldn't our embassy be in Jerusalem? <coughs> they say it's their capital, just like we say Washington's ours. Uh, as it Fanyoy Rose of Oakdale, Minnesota. Um, thank you, Congress, Mark, for this meeting. My friends and I traveled five hours <coughs> to, to join you. Um, we're glad that we're all discussing issues that are common interest to all of us. My question is going to be a little bit away from what we've been discussing. Um, it's a projection to something that we think will have a huge negative effect on the American economy if not paid attention to. Um, you may or may not have learned about the genocide that's going on um, in a part of the world called Southern Cameroon, Amazonia. Uh, there's a, that genocide is going on. You have already? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll talk about it. Still. Yeah, yeah, right. Our fears are that this genocide has a direct and indirect effect, effect on a huge part of the electorate um, that come from, that originate from that part of the world. That's us. Some of the effects are really true traumatic, so psychological trauma and uh, financial. But my question is, can we count on um, the, the House of Foreign Affairs Committee to start looking at this problem that has a potential huge economic effect on the American Well, society? you know, in the first before the meeting started, you know, I said that, you know, I am very sympathetic, you know, and with you folks uh, in what is going on there. You know, I will, you know, talk to um, Congressman Smith of New Jersey, who is the Africa Subcommittee Chair, as well as Full Committee Chair Royce, to see what his intentions are on uh, the Cameroon issue. And as I said, as far as contact with the State Department is concerned, we have to wait for both Mr. Pompeo to be confirmed as Secretary of State and then to have an Assistant Secretary of State uh, uh, for African Affairs be nominated by the President to be confirmed by the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then I've got, is it Carl Camanjo and two kids? And this looks like a address. <laughs> 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 yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, Boy, I've known you ever since I was uh, uh, chair of legislative affairs in the student government, the UW Stevens mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to follow your footsteps and admired you, the late uh, William Proxmire and all that. But yeah, like 
the gentle lady said, uh, British Southern Cameroon is my roots. Mm -hmm. And Dean James, I just left church. I'm thinking, knowing who you are, where you've been. When all these things are put in place in the house committee, we would employ you to make this uh, a personal crusade of yours because you'll be surprised. You'll be shocked how a people can be wiped out because they're Anglo-Saxon. They're doing the right things. They're kind. They're sharing. They're non-violent. It, it, it just it bothers me. And we have a dictator who was put there by the French for 36 years. That has been in government since 1960. He's not here. 86 years old. Now he's using kids to be killing kids in the name of the military. It's sad. And he can get away with this because he thinks uh, he's a favored dictator by the West, mm -hmm. by the French. So I will employ you. I mean, you're not George Cooney, but <laughs> I mean, you are George Cooney and Southern Sudan, but you are a fatherly figure I've known for, for decades, and you will not be disappointed. In fact, if you keep in touch with us, you'll be surprised. How did I not know this? So yeah, there's about 30 uh, elected officials from the state of Maryland who are worried about this. They've written to Tillerton, um, Congressman Bass, uh, Congress, a lot of your colleagues from Indiana, Minnesota. It's, it's bad. Well, you know, let me see. I'll try. And, you know, I will talk to both the full and subcommittee chair in order to see what's on their mind. You know, I'm kind of on the bottom of the list as a new kid on the the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, but, you know, this is something that is important. I knew that something was going on there, but until this afternoon, I did not know how bad it is. Well, that concludes, that concludes the number of people who signed up to speak. As I said at the outset, the second part of the meeting will be devoted to individual and personal problems with state and federal agencies. The complaint window for state agencies is there. The federal agencies is here. Please do not continue the uh, general issues discussion because the personal problems folks have been very, very patient for about an hour and a quarter. Hope you'll keep the cards and letters coming. Uh, and remember, no taping or videoing uh, of the second part of the meeting uh, to protect the privacy of the people who wish to approach either Representative Sam Flip or me. Enjoy the nice day, and this part of the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>